one of the calls I occasionally get from my referring hematologist colleagues is they'll call and say, Dr. Raza, we have a patient who has high risk disease, so we are not supposed to chelate them. But the patient is now two years out and I feel kind of wrong not doing it. And I'll say you're absolutely right. If the patient is two years out, they, do, they are unlikely to have higher risk disease. This is one of those inaccuracies of our classifying systems. If you follow just the natural history of the disease, the patient is behaving like a lower risk disease. By all means, institute chelation. So for me, there is no hard and fast rule that if this patient has been classified as high risk, no matter how many transfusions they get and how high the ferritin, I'm not going to intervene because somebody at NCC and guideline decided that this is the guideline and they shouldn't do it. No, those guidelines are very helpful but they can't be strictly applied to every individual patient right. because they're just not real for an individual. And this is what I want to emphasize. Please do not try and um, limit your iron chelation therapy to only lower risk patients. No, there isn't, you're absolutely right. And for Deferocyrox, there was a notation that uh, on the label that it, it is, quote, not indicated for higher risk MDS. But that's not the same as saying it's contraindicated, and I think you have to make a decision for the person and how their disease course is behaving to see if that's a valuable thing for yeah. them. You yeah. know, there is a recent book out by Dr. Vince DeVita, who was the director of the NCI for many, many years, called The Death of Cancer, in which he recounts one thing. He says, as a, uh, as a fellow in training, uh, there was a patient who had brain mets, and his teacher was Dr. Freireich, who's now at MD Anderson. And Dr. Freireich told him to give this medication, inject it into the spine, give it intrathecally. And he said, but on the bottle it says, do not inject intrathecally. Do you really want me to give it? And Dr. Freireich stood there and saying, I order you to do it, do it now. And he did it and that saved the patient's life. In other words, there is some leeway, some kind of freedom to be able to use your own clinical judgment that at this point in time for this individual patient, I am pushed into such a corner that the best way I can serve the patient is go against the grain and give him this. So at one point we had that freedom to use our clinical judgment. In today's day and age, these kinds of lines drawn on the sand or etched in stone are beaten upon our cerebrum with such force as if, uh, if you really do something even slightly different using your medical and clinical judgment, then you should be put in jail. That is not true. That's not the practice of real <coughs> medicine. I do not think anybody will be incarcerated for chelation. <laughs> uh, not if it's done appropriately, I hope. Um, and you make a, you're bringing it back to a point you started with, and it's one with which I agree, and I'm sure Dr. Steensma will agree also, that this is a disease that we have to treat the person. It's a disease yes. where there's a face in front of you and a person in front of you, and you have to do the right thing for that person. And that person in front of you for many years. Yes. You know, you have observed the patient for 10 years sometimes. I mean, I'm friends with patients who have had children and grandchildren. <laughs> Uh, during nice. the course of uh, how long I have taken care of them. So they, they become like family members. You know how their body is responding much better than some guideline is going to tell you.